Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and after putting it off for a little while, I thought we would, before Christmas, we'll have a look at the Planet Zoo Europe pack, and all the five animals that came with it, the Fire Salamander, the European Badger, the Alpine Ibex, the Fallow Deer, and last but definitely not least, the Eurasian Lynx. So, yeah, this was a really interesting pack. I really like the scenery that came with it, but we're, of course, going to go through the animals. So we're going to start with the only habitat animal of the pack. We're going to have a look at the European Salamander, or the Fire Salamander. I believe that's the proper name for it. Oh, this wonderful little guy. Let's look at him there. We can go into um, Alt F2. Have a look at him in there. Let's look at that little wonderful little guy. I like the Fire Salamander. Just trying to get the perfect view for him. There we are, we got the fire salamander right here. So the fire salamander is a common species of salamander that's found pretty much all across Europe. They typically live in forests of Central Europe and more common in the hilly areas, they're like slightly higher elevations. Where they live in these detritus forests where they'll find like... Um, all sorts of fallen leaves and logs and stuff to live and hide under to keep moist as well and they need small brooks and ponds in their habitat with clean water so they can develop their larvae and their diet consists of various insects spiders earthworms slugs occasionally they will eat newts and young frogs as well but in captivity they can be fed crickets mealworms waxworms and silkworms and small um, prey is caught uh, within the range of their uh, volumere teeth from the posterior half or the back half of their tongue which the prey adheres to and they can weigh about 40 grams and the fire salamander is actually one of Europe's largest salamanders they can grow up to 25 centimeters or 9.8 inches but they normally range between 15 and 25 or 59 to 9.8 inches long so quite big so uh, in terms of reproduction they look very similar normally both males and females until the breeding season where their most uh, conspicuous difference is a sol swollen gland that's around the male's vent. And this gland uh, produces the spermatophore, which is a kind of a sperm packet where they kind of uh, uh, release it and then the female comes over and takes it. So it's really interesting. The courtship also happens on uh, land as well. So the male will become aware of a potential mate. He'll confront her and then blocks her path. And then he kind of rubs her chin to express his interest in mating and then crawls beneath her and grasps her front limbs uh, with his own in our plexus and he deposits, uh, deposits the spermophyte on the ground then attempts to lower the female's cloaca, uh, cloaca in contact with it and if successful the female draws the sperm packet into her and the eggs fertilize that's very very interesting so another really cool thing about these guys are quite toxic. They have their primary alkaloid toxin is um, samadarin, which causes strong muscle convulsions and hypertension com combined with hyperventilation in vertebrates. So if you kind of got this bad of the tops and you'd get hypertension, hyperventilation and convulsions, which is very, very bad. And the poison glands of the fire um, salamander are concentrated in certain areas around the body, especially around the head. Like you can see in other amphibians, you can see that here. And um, they're concentrated there, especially around the head and the dorsal skin surface. And the colored patterns usually coincide with these glands. So this is basically a warning because usually in nature, bright blue or yellow or green, or not green, and red, usually just say, stay away from me, I'm toxic. So that's why they have these bright colors to warn them. And um, it actually shows that they may actually be effective with um, preventing bacterial and fungal infections uh, on the skin. And can be potentially dangerous to humans, so you've got to be careful with that. So, as I mentioned, they're found mostly across southern and central Europe, and they're most commonly found at altitudes between 250 meters or 820 feet, by 1,000 meters or 3,300 feet, and only being really found below. So, how in the Balkans they are common if they have high altitudes, and in Germany they can be found on lower. So, yeah, very, very interesting little guy here. So, let's have a look at the species field guide. Look at this wonderful little man. Look at him, wonderful little me. He's so happy. I like him. <laughs> so now let's have a look at the Fire Salamander Zoopedia. Where is it? Zoopedia, there we are. 
So unknown, the fire salamander is an amphibian that lives in the deciduous forest. Yep, pretty much covers that. Not endangered. And you can see their range here, very well expanded. It's Portugal, pretty much all over Central Europe. Very interesting. Um, looks like you can house about one to six in uh, a tank. They have no dominance really, none other than male may aggression. Uh, though male aggression may occur over access to food and mates, and they are promiscuous. Size is about 23 uh, centimeters long, and they live for about 19, 20 years, and they weigh about 40 grams. So they reach their age of sexual maturity about five years old, and they're sexually sterile until death. They offer about one to three babies per mating event, and uh, gestate for about four months, and give birth every 22 months, and they're easy to reproduce the captivity. So that's very, very awesome. And a research status, so we have a uh, fire salamanders are most, uh, mostly found under damp, decaying leaves, uh, matter on the ground. And yeah, we kind of went all through these. Uh, according to legend, the fire salamander received its name because it was born in fires. Most likely they were hidden in woods that humans gathered to build fires and then escaped by crawling out the embers. That's a cool little story. They tend to stay in their home range for many years, so we were returning to the same spots for their winter hibernation. That's really, really cool. And also this is interesting, in most subspecies of fire salamander, Offspring develop in eggs inside the female to be born as live aquatic larvae. However, in the um, Fasona and Bernardzi variations or subspecies, they can give birth to fully metamorphosized young that skip the aquatic stage. So that's very, very interesting. Probably interesting adaption to uh, since they probably don't have as much water in their range. But anyway, that's our first exhibit animal done. We're going to be moving on next to the first habitat animal. And we've got something very, very small and cute. We have got the European Badger. How wonderful. So we'll have a look at this big guy here. I'm a really big fan of how the Badger came out. So the European Badger is a Badger species that can be found pretty much all over Europe. Uh, from like the UK and all that. Really, really interesting. And their class is least concerned likely because they're very, very common and very, very large population. Though they have been increasing in some regions as well. But decreasing at others, of course. Um, several subspecies are recognized, but the uh, nominant subspecies, um, M. Uh, meles meles, is predominantly found in most of Europe. And um, looks like he's going into the habitat. We'll have a look at him in there. Get the camera view. So let's have a look at him right here. So we've got a couple badges coming in here. Isn't that cool? So, uh, in the Europe where there's no other badger species, they're generally just called a badger, but they're technically the European badger. And we'll have watch them while they're in here. So you can see here they're very, very powerfully built with a black and white, brown and grey uh, animal with a small stocky head there. And you can see those small um, black eyes along with the short tail. And they can get pretty big. They vary between 7 to 13 kilograms or uh, 15 to 29 pounds in spring. But they build up to be up to 15 and 17 kilograms or 33 to 37 pounds in autumn before they sleep uh, during the winter. They are nocturnal and also social, so they burrow, uh, burrow animals sleep together during the day and uh, one has several sets in its um, territorial range, so it's where it kind of lives. And uh, they, these burrows can have multiple entrances and um, chambers and they're actually used by badger families, even several badger families for many decades. And they're quite fussy over these burrows and the cleanliness as well, so they carry around fresh bedding uh, in and remove spoiled material. And they defecate in latrines that are strategically placed outside the sets uh, or en route to other sets. So they pretty much try and avoid that as much as possible. Let's uh, head out of here and have a look at one outside. Are they all inside? Outside? I'll have a look at the baby while we're talking about the baby now. So, or not they're classified as a carnival. You can see these guys are very, very cute. They feed on a wide variety of things. They'll feed on earthworms, large insects, small mammals, carrion, cereals, and tubers. And litters can be up to five cubs, and they're all produced in spring. The young are weaned for a few months uh, after sucking from the mother, but they will usually remain in their family groups, so they'll stay there long term. And the European badger best known is for sharing its burrows with many other species found on its range, uh, such as rabbits, red foxes, and raccoon dogs, but can be ferocious when provoked, and is a trait that's been exploited, or used to be exploited, in an illegal buds, blood sports called badger baiting, which they obviously would kind of uh, poke the badger until they kind of get angry, so it's illegal now, which is good, good for animal welfare. <laughs> but, um... Another thing about these guys is they can be carriers for bovine tuberculosis, which affects cattle. And in England, 
Culling of the badger populations was used as an attempt to uh, reduce the bovine tuberculosis in cattle, although this practice or the um, is not only for welfare but the efficacy or how useful it is has been put a lot into question uh, and have been widely considered as inhumane. So it's probably not going to really help. Still really, really cute little guys, if I do say so myself. Where's the other one? I think they're all in their bur uh, burrow now. Let's have a look in the burrow again. Select habitat, uh, enter camera view. It is four of them in the burrow and one popping out now. Nom, nom. So he comes out now, how wonderful. So let's have a look at the Zoopedia. So least concerned as we mentioned, there are large uh, species of uh, badger, uh, mustard lip that live in woodlands, scrubbing even man-made parks. Mm. Yeah, pretty cool, mentioned all of that. You can see their range here. This range actually includes the Caucasian or badger, or the Caucasus badger. And we can see their uh, population there. We mentioned they live in small family groups. So the group size, excluding the juveniles, is about one to seven. So six males, six females. Male bachelor groups can be one to three, and females one to seven. Uh, dominance, they have hierarchy uh, based on age and size. They're promiscuous, they're shy, and guests cannot enter the habitat. Our average size is about 75 centimeters long. Uh, yeah, that looks about right. Uh, life expectancy is 17 years, and their weight on average. Males are slightly bigger at 12 kilograms, and females at 10.3. So they reach age of sexual maturity about two years, and uh, breed until they die. They can have up to five offspring per mating. The gestation or incubation period is about two months, and the interbirth period is about 12 months. And they are okay to breed in captivity, so that's interesting. So let's have a look um, at some of these. In some European countries, badgers are attributed as the heralds of spring in folklore, and commonly occur in fables, where they're described as reclusive and um, courageous, likely due to their shy and nocturnal behavior. <laughs> and um, European badger hair is often used for um, shaving brooms or for making sporins. Yeah. Let me announce that. And European badgers also commonly eat hedgehogs, one of the only species that are able to do so due to their tough paws and dexterous claws. We mentioned about the tuberculosis thing, especially in the UK. We mentioned that as well. Let's see what species they can share. So they don't really like anyone living with them. That's fine. I think they're beautiful how they are. Look at this wonderful cutie. It'd be cool to see what people make out of these badgers in the future. I love these guys. Um, now we're going to move on to our next animal. We have got a next animal look at this <laughs> look how cute this is so we'll have a look at the uh, alpine ibex well, i want to have a look at the male because the male is certainly very impressive look at that so the alpine ibex also known as the um sternbok or born queen or simply just ibex uh really wonderful animal here is a species of wild goat that lives in the mountains of the european alps and they're quite sexually dimorphic, as you can see here. These wonderful big males got these large set of horns here and quite big and impressive. And the females are much less obvious and uh, tend to have a grayer coat. Oh, this wonderful big guy. We'll have to keep talking about him. And um, they tend to live on steep, rough terrain near the snow line. And they're also social, so adults, and male and females, will segregate for most of the year. And they'll come together only to mate. And four distinct groups within these social groups exist. The adult male groups, the female offspring groups, the groups of young individuals, and mixed sex groups. So, um, as I mentioned, they've got a quite a big appearance. They stand to about 90 to 101 centimeters tall, or 35 to 40 since inches at the withers, and a body length of 149 to 171 centimeters, or 59 to 67 uh, inches with a weight of 67 to 117 kilograms, or 148 to 258 pounds for males. Females are typically smaller. They reach about 73 to 84 centimeters, or 29 to 33 inches, a body length of 121 to 141 centimeters, or 48 to 61 inches, and a weight of between 17 to 32 kilograms, or 37 to 71 pounds. And you can see they all both have these large backwards horns, but the males are much, much larger at about 69 to 98 centimeters, or about 27 to 39 inches, while the female is only about 18 to 35 centimeters, or 7 to 13 inches. So the male definitely has the more impressive pair. So, as I mentioned, they live pretty much everywhere. This alpine ibex, they live in the French Alps, and it's believed they would have lived in other areas. They prefer habitat below, uh, above the... Um, they live along the snow line, but they prefer to live in alpine forests, and they can hang out during the 
It typically acts uh, absent in woodland areas, but they can be found in some populated areas. They spend their winter in the coniferous forests, and for most of the year they occupy different habitats, with females relying on steep habitat more than the males. And during their foraging, they're strictly herbivorous. They eat lots of grasses and the remains of they'll eat like twigs, branches, things like that. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, they kind of um, just feed on whatever they can. And during December is when the breeding season starts and it lasts for about six weeks. During this time, the male will head into smaller groups and shirts of females. The rut will take place in two phases where the males of the group uh, interacts with the females all in estrus. At the highest of the male ranks, get the closest he can get to the females, where the males will perform courtship dances like the rut, where they kind of crash into each other. And um, they'll copulate, the male that wins gets to copulate, and gestation for these guys lasts about 167 days. Or well, they give birth to two kits, uh, or kids really. I think it's kits and kids. We'll give, oh, this is a really cute kid, don't you think? And um, usually give birth to one or two, with 80% uh, twins making up 20% of births. So they reach their sexual maturity at about 18 months old, but females do not reach their maximum body size until 5 or 6 years, and males for 9 to 11 years. And the horns of the males and females will grow throughout their lives, and growing most rapidly during their second year of life, and therefore about uh, thereafter about 8 centimeters a year, which is effectively slowing down all the rate of animals of 10 half the rate to animals 10 years of age, so as they get older they grow slower. And alpine ibex have been known to live up to 19 years in the wild. So very, very interesting. So we'll talk about um, your conservation status. They are typically considered least concerned, but that wasn't always the case. They historically ranged throughout France, Italy, Switzerland, uh, Austria, and Slovenia. And starting about the 16th century, when first, uh, the uh, first firearms became really common, they were overpopulation declined due to overexploitation and hunting and they were extirpated from Switzerland and Germany by the 18th century and by Austria and northwestern Italy by the 19th so they pretty much remained only in the uh, certain areas where they were able like the western Italian Alps something like that and uh, they were actually uh, the place where they were last found was declared as a hunting reserve so the numbers of hunters going up there was controlled so that really helped their uh, population also they were protected from poaching and their numbers increased uh, reaching about 3,000 in about 1914 and they further um, enjoyed further protections uh, in that area when it was made a national park in 1922 and, and although this population naturally dispersed into the surrounding regions but also there was a lot of reintroductions as well and for, to give them to new populations and to the, as of today the Alpine Ibex population is about 30,000 and it's considered least concerned by the IUCN, though they do have low genetic diversity, which puts them at risk for inbreeding depression. Uh, but um, they seem to be doing quite well so far, as hence they're called least concerned. Let me look at the females uh, while we're talking about them. Let them go. Really, really cute. And we get this cool enrichment for them as well. They're going to go up there. They're just going to run around. How beautiful. So now we're going to have a look at the uh, Zoopedia. So talk about the Alpine Ibex. Here yeah, they mentioned the wild population is about 30,000. Uh, kind of went over a lot of that. Uh, medieval times are overhunted. You can see their range here. So this is their modern range. Uh, but they've been reintroduced to some areas. So that's awesome. So in terms of their groups, group size can be up to 2 to 20. So up to 1 male and 19 females. Bachelor groups can be 2 to 8. And female bachelor groups can be 2 to 20. So dominance, the males will fight for the right to mate, and females have rank based on groups based on age. They're polygamous and they're confident, and humans cannot enter the habitat. So in terms of their size, male stands about 97 uh, centimeters tall at the shoulder on average, and females 79. Uh, 97, uh, that's what I wrote. Life expectancy is about 21 years uh, for both sexes, and the average weight for a male ibex is 90 kilos, and for female, 24 kilos. So their age of sexual maturity is about two years old. Their age of sexual sterility is about 15. And none of the offspring, uh, number of offsprings per mating event is usually one, so they can have twins, as we mentioned. Gestation period is about six months, and interbirth period is about 12 months, and they're easy to reproduce in captivity. It's really, really wonderful. So let's have a look at some of the uh, fun facts. The diet of alpine ibexes are naturally deficient in salt, which they use often, which is why they often like to leach salt off of rocky surfaces. That's true. Um, 
Alpine ibexes appear to be under little threat of predators, with most ibexes dying of old age diseases or starvation. True. Very good climbers, as we mentioned. Uh, based uh, Male hierarchies uh, based on horn size. The large individual horns, the highest position. And ibex hooves are curved undersides and thin edges act like suction cups that enable them to grip onto steep surfaces. That's all pretty cool. And they seem to not like anyone. So that's really, really cool. Okay. So next we've got our second to last animal. Uh, moving on to another ungulate, we have got the European fallow deer. So that's really cool. Also known as the common fallow deer or just fallow deer. Though there is also the per, uh, Persian fallow deer to worry about. Really, really wonderful animal if I do say so myself. So um, these guys, a male fallow deer is known as a buck and um, they can get to about 140 to 160 centimeters or 55 to uh, 63 inches long 80 to 95 centimeters tall or 33 to 37 inches in shoulder height and typically between 60 and 100 kilograms or 130 to 220 pounds in weight with those being a little bit smaller at about 130 to 150 centimeters or 51 to 59 inches long 75 to 85 centimeters uh, 30 to 33 inches tall and um shoulder and about 30 to 50 kilograms or 66 to 110 pounds with the largest bucks as well getting about 190 centimeters or 79 inches long and a weight of 150 kilograms and fawns usually born in spring are about 30 centimeters long or 12 inches and uh are about four and a half kilograms so we'll have a look at them while we're pointing out very much of a cutie we'll have a look at the females while we're talking about them so you can see much of their variation comes from their coat. You can get like melanistic and leucistic ones. Very, very interesting. And only males have antlers. Uh, so you can see they're quite big as well. And they're quite fast as well. They can run at a maximum speed of 50 kilo kilo kilometers per hour or 30 miles over short distances. And can jump up to five, uh, 1 5, so 1.75 meters tall or 5 feet 9 uh, inches uh, tall. Uh, height, jump, and up to 5 meters long or 16 feet. So that's very interesting. So they are native to most of Europe during the late interglacial. And during the Pleistocene, their distribution was from restricted to the Middle East because of refugia. But the fossil evidence suggests that they may uh, kind of... The population was very fragmentary during that time. And we don't really know their true range. Some people consider them invasives in some places. It's a very, very uh, complicated topic. Really interesting. Then they have been uh, considered extinct in a lot of places. The natural population was... Turkey, that's the only place they had definitely uh, natural population since the last glacial maximum. But um, other places like the Southern Balkans and uh, other places like Rhodesia, the Balkans, Greek Islands, uh, we have uh, evidence that they were living there before the Ice Age, but we really don't know uh, exactly where their native range should be, quote unquote. But they've been introduced in places all around the world, such as uh, South Africa. Mauritius, Madagascar, the Seychelles, New Zealand, uh, the Falkland Islands, United States, Lebanon, Cape Verde, a lot of places, especially Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand, they're quite common for hunting. Well, we'll talk about the mating. So these guys obviously mainly herbivores. They feed on whatever they can, like browsing and grazing. Really cool animals. But yeah, so they're very, very highly sexually dimorphic, as you can see with the males with these large antlers. And the breeding season or rut takes place uh, across 135 days. And in the northern hemisphere, they'll breed in October, which occurs in April in the, uh, and April in the south, just depending on hemisphere they're in. And um, they will develop lurks where the males will conjugate in small groups of mating territories, uh, where the female will kind of come visit and figure out, ooh, is this a big male that I want to have babies with? And the males will also compete with each other and they'll maintain like a small group with, that they will mate with. And um, once the uh, males kind of got all the females he wants and uh, bred them, they can... Uh, what's the parental care? They have a gestation period, as I believe... Uh, I'm trying to find the gestation period. Probably about... A, 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 the gestation period is about 245 days, and usually give birth to a single form, as we can find here. Very much a little cutie, I think. And um, twins can be found, but they're quite rare. The females can um, convene when they're about. The females can um, conceive when they're about 16 months old, so a little over a year 
the baby fours can have babies, though the males can successfully breed in 16 months old. Most do not breed until they're 48 months old because uh, they can't really compete with the big males. <laughs> and um, females can be very cagey just before they give birth and they'll find secluded areas to give birth, which is to obviously to try and protect them. And as soon as the female gives birth, the, uh, the female will lick the fawn clean, which helps initiate that maternal bond and also shows that, that parental investment since males kind of just don't do anything, don't have anything to do with raising the little fawn. And um, after the birth of the fawn, the female does not return for the herd at least 10 days, and for most of the days the mother is separated from the fawn, returning only to feed the fawn. The nursing period for these fawns lasts about 4 months and happens uh, every 4 hours each day, and rumination is a very, very important part of the fawn's life, and this develops 2-3 to three weeks into the fawn's life. And they initiate weaning, weaning periods of about 20, at about 20 days, 3-4 to four weeks later. The fawn will start to follow its mother and rejoin the herd. And the mother frequently licks uh, where the baby's anal area is to stimulate uh, suckling and urination, which is very important for the develop, uh, developing the, uh, the, the fawn. And weaning is, they're completely weaned off their mother about 7 months old, and at about 12 months the fawn is independent, and after uh, 335 days of reproduction, that fawn, the rut will come to an end, and then they'll kind of go back to their normal groups, and the lurk will disperse. So yeah, very, very cool. Um, they've been in serious decline uh, in Turkey, uh, where they're definitely thought to be native, uh, because of obviously hunting. And there have been like uh, semi-wild populations found around. and But generally most populations are fine, since uh, there's actually invasive in a lot of places. Uh, we'll have a look at the female while we're running about. Or the male, we'll have a look at the male. But due to their wide distribution, especially in their invasive populations, and um, there are some populations that are at risk of things like climate change, such as roads. But generally they are considered uh, least concerned because they are so common around the world. Uh, and, but we don't know exactly where their native range are, as I mentioned, but still really, really cool. I really like the fallow deer. So yeah, we'll have a look at the Zoopedia. As Dharma Dharma, that's a good scientific name. Already mentioned the size and everything. This is uh, where they can be naturally found. Though there are populations, as I mentioned, Australia, New Zealand, and the US for hunting. So people like hunting them. So group sizes, uh, 3 to 16, so 1 male and up to 15 females. Uh, male bachelor groups can be 3 to 6, with females being 3 to 15. Dominance, the age hierarchy in bachelor groups, males fight over dominance in mating groups. Mating system is polygamous, uh, they're neutral to humans and cannot enter their habitat. So in general size, uh, 90 centimeters tall at the shoulder and uh, for males and 80 for females. Life expectancy for males a little shorter, about 15 years, while females get 18 years. And uh, weight to males on average about 80 kilos, while females about 40. Um, the age of sexual maturity is about four years old, and uh, they stroll until they die. They can breathe until they die. They often have one or one to two babies per uh, breeding event. Gestation period is about eight months, and the interbirth birth period is about 12 months, and they're easy to reproduce in captivity. So let's have a look at some of these little facts here. So um, European fellow do have excellent eyesight and hearing to detect the very slightest movements in their surrounding, which helps them avoid predation, that's true. Uh, the antlers of European fallow deer can be up to 60 centimeters long and shed every year. The fallow deer can stand up within 30 minutes of being burn, born. Um, while the antlers of European fallow deer are growing, they are covered in velvet, and when growth is complete, the velvet is shed and the antlers may temporarily have a tattered appearance. We already mentioned this. Uh, with a species of fallow deer native to Europe before the ice, uh, ice Age, European fallow deer is thought to be native to Turkey, Italy, and Greece. It's suspected that the Romans spread the species throughout the continent during their rule. Nowadays, European fallow deer have been introduced to countries across the world. So, very, very interesting to think uh, how they spread. And um, they don't really benefit from hanging out with anyone. But yeah, really, really nice bunch of animals. I'm a big fan of this Europe pack. And last, we have got uh, everyone's favorite uh, cat that everyone wanted. We've got the Eurasian lynx. It's a really, really beautiful uh, animal we got here, I think. Look how beautiful. So the Eurasian lynx, you can tell here, is a medium-sized wildcat that is found across Europe, uh, especially most of Europe, and also Central Asia and Siberia, the Tibetan to, to Plateau and the Himalayas, where they live in all sorts of different temperate and boreal forests. And due to their wide distribution, um, 
they're threatened by habitat loss. Uh, despite their large distribution, they're threatened by habitat loss, uh, fragmentation, uh, poaching, and depletion of prey. But they are listed as least concern. So these guys, as I mentioned, are the largest of the four lynx species. They range in body length between uh, 76 to 106 centimeters, or 30 to 42 inches in males, and 73 to 99 uh, centimeters, or 29 to 39 inches in females. It's their body length. And their standing height at the shoulder is uh, about 55 to 75 to 22 to 30 um, inches in shoulder um, height. And the tail mentions about 11 to 24 centimeters, or 4.3 to 9.6 inches. And the weight of both sexes can vary a lot. They can range from 12 to 32 kilograms, or 26 to 71 pounds. But more than 30 kilograms is very, very rare, and it's possibly exaggerated. And those um, can get some kids small, some populations. But these guys are typically big. Big medium cat. Largest of all the four lynx species. And um, as I mentioned, they're pretty much found in rugged country across uh, Europe and Central Asia. They can be found in rocky mountains, boreal forests, mountain forests. And um, they tend to be less common where you can find grey wolves, but they, because uh, they have been reported to eat lynx, but these guys generally do good around uh, most of their range. So there have been some populations where they've been extirpated, such as uh, Western Europe and um, Scandinavia, where they almost went extinct, but their populations have been increasing because of protection, so that's really, really awesome. And um, also found in Asia as well, uh, Central Asia. Apparently there have been fossils of uh, lynx from the late Pleistocene that lived in the Japan archipelago, and they potentially went extinct in that region, uh, in the Holocene. And um, in terms of their ecology, they're normally nocturnal or crepuscular, so they've come out during either dawn or dusk or at night where they come to hunt and they spend their day sleeping in dense thickets and stuff. The hunting area of a normal Eurasian lynx is about 20 to 250, uh, 450 square kilometers or 7.7 .7 or 173.7 square miles. That depends on the availability of prey. So if it's very, very prey dense, they'll have a smaller range. And uh, males tend to live in areas uh, and maintain territories larger than the females. So they can have multiple females within their range. And they will mark these territories using feces, uh, urine, and scrape marks. Very similar to how like, domestic cats will. And in terms of their diet, they have a very, very, very diet. Where they'll feed on hares, rabbits, squirrels, uh, all sorts of small rodents, mussolids, wild boar, young deers such as roe deer, moose, and red deer. And just pretty much whatever they can get their mouths around, as long as it's a good prey. And even in Asia, it's not too different. They'll feed on pretty much whatever they can find, like roe deer, uh, hare, pika marmots and goats so pretty much what they can get their mouths around again and the primary predators of these guys are lynx and wolverine and in russian forests we know that they will kill and eat lynx that fail to escape into trees and uh that can be one of their things also um red fox and the eagle owl are competitors for these guys especially in russia it's very interesting and we'll talk about the reproduction as we have a look at this cute little baby lynx uh cub very very cute um the mating season for these guys usually lasts from January to April, and the female will typically go to estrus only once during this period, which will last about four to seven days. And if the first litter is lost, the second period of estrus is common, and um, gestation usually lasts after the female gets pregnant for 67 to 74 days. Uh, pregnant females can construct their den in secluded locations and often protected by branches and things. Oh, look how cute that is. Oh, how cute. And the den is littered with uh, like feathers, deer hairs, and things like that to provide bedding for the young. And at birth, a little baby European lynx uh, or Eurasian lynx uh, can weigh between 240 to 430 grams or 85 to 15 uh, ounces and open their eyes after about 10 to 12 days of life. They initially have this plain grayish brown fur and they are, find this adult coloration at about 11 weeks old. They begin to take solid food about six or seven weeks where they begin to leave their den and are now fully weaned from their mothers at about five to six months. And the den is also abandoned two, abandoned two to three months after Lynx is born, but the young will typically remain with their mother until about 10 months of age. And Eurasian Lynx will reach sexual maturity at about two or three years old and have lived for 21 years in captivity. And females usually have two kittens, but litters more than three are rare, but can still happen. And as I mentioned, they are least concerned since they have such a wide range though lots of their range they are either 
were nearly extinct or even driven to extinction locally, but there seems to be lots of conservation programs since they're illegal to hunt them in many countries. But then also there's a lot of um, conservation works reintroducing lynx into a lot of areas where they've been extinct. So it's really, really interesting and good conservation. These guys are doing quite well. Pretty much everything in this list is least concerned. So that's uh, quite uh, good to uh, know. But yeah, this is our last animal, Eurasian lynx. I believe this is the male. I'll look at the male for a bit. Really, really wonderful. I really like how these all came out. I'm really happy. This is probably one of the best packs I think that's happened so far. I think the, all the animals are really good quality and the building pack is just incredible. So I definitely think this is one of the better packs and it's cool that we got a good review of it. So yeah, I'm going to pull out and uh, say uh, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoy this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe and Merry Christmas. Uh, since I might not have a video before that, and a Happy New Year to you all. So yeah, bye-bye.